Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Martin Willemink. I am co-founder and CEO at SecMed, and I'm happy to uh, present a, uh, a new uh, Bytes of Innovation um, uh, introduction for the webinar here. Uh, Bytes of Innovation is, uh, provides a deep dive into the future of medicine, and we do this with renowned experts such as researchers, physicians, investors, and lawyers. Uh, we do it every other Thursday, uh, so we have one today. We actually, in two weeks, is RSNA, so, uh, and then after that, it's the holidays and everything, so we will, uh, this is our last uh, Bytes of Innovation webinar of the year, and next year we will continue. Um, the concept is 15 minutes of presentation by the expert, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A, which is moderated by Aline Lutz, who is the Senior Medical Director at SecMed, uh, and by me. So all participants, make sure to put your questions in the chat box so that we can discuss them during the Q&A phase of the presentation. So today, I am proud to announce that we have uh, Kristin Yakimov amongst us. She graduated summa cum laude with her bachelor's in electrical engineering. She also holds a master's in electrical engineering from Stanford University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Uh, Kristin has, uh, is an experienced healthcare executive, having held senior leadership roles at Medtronic and GE Healthcare. And previously, she was a vice president of healthcare strategy and innovation at Microsoft Nuance. And she also has hold, held a role as vice president of product at Change Healthcare. And today, Kristen is going to talk about the Artificial Intelligence Fellow. Kristen, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you, Martin. Let me see if I can uh, get the screen share going. Yeah, I just unshared. All right. Are we good? Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. Right. Fantastic. So I was a freshly minted electrical engineer, uh, just leaving the camp, warm campus of Stanford. And I was headed north to the frozen tundra of Minnesota to join Medtronic. I had always wanted to be in medicine. And I found at a young age, I was actually better with math and complicated equations than I was re with remembering huge words. Um, and so engineering was the path that I wanted to take. And so I was really excited about the chance to work at Medtronic at this point, because it was really at the height of the innovation on implantable cardiac devices. And what better way to create a product that would help bring people to full life than to get into the area of pacing and defibrillation. Medtronic was very thoughtful um, on onboarding new engineering talent. And they had worked with a number of their clinical innovators in order to create this visiting scientist program. And so I applied to that and was accepted by Medtronic and the Mayo Clinic. And Mayo was generous enough to allow me to spend three months with them in their cardiology department. My job down there was going to be to observe follow-ups and implants and create process maps. And those process maps we would then use for to drive innovation in our medical devices. And I so I did my homework. <laughs> I read all those technical manuals, probably the only person who ever read those technical manuals. I watched all the training. Um, I even took a class on anatomy, um, so I knew what was going on a little bit. I knew I was going to learn a lot, but my goal was, and my hope was, that I would also be able to, when I was down there, explain some of the great new technical features and all the cool things that our, our device could do. So I started in the pacing clinic, and I was watching both remote and in-person follow-ups. And then reality hit. I listened as the nursing staff spent half the time allotted with a gentleman on a remote follow-up, just trying to explain where to find the pacemaker and how to put this magnet over the device. I then went to an in-person follow-up and someone's grandma was there and she was really scared. She was scared because something didn't feel right. She didn't understand what was going on, but she knew that there was this computer with a battery and wires into her heart and that thing was supposedly keeping her alive. And the nursing staff, in addition to needing to go through the follow-up, also needed to make sure that they reassured her, gave her confidence and comfort. And then I walked out and I walked through the waiting rooms and they were full, right? There were lots of people out there that were looking to get access to the talent of the Mayo team to help with their cardiac issues. And I realized that every minute that was being spent was actually tied to access. And so all the cool features that worked, all the cool diagnostics that we could do with looking at every heartbeat and every accelerometer, in the scheme of things and in that context, 
they really weren't, some of them really weren't important. They weren't being used and they really shouldn't have been because in that context, they weren't as important as some of the other things. So why the story when we're thinking about AI? Well, I think it's, you know, in my view, AI is not about the product. It's not about the technology. It's not about the product working. Yes, 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 all those things are necessary, but they're not sufficient. When I think that we look at AI, I think we really need to think about this as a AI fellow or a computer teammate that's gonna enable a new process. And that new process is gonna drive an improved outcome and an improved experience. And I think this framing of experience, team, fellow, teammate, in addition to the tech, has really meaningful implications as we start to think about what use cases we want to pursue as technologists, the ROIs we develop for those use cases, and the work that our innovation collaborations need to do in order to get these new experiences and new care models across the chasm and into use. So, you know, onboarding a new teammate, if we kind of go with this analogy of an AL fellow being our new computer teammate, you know, it affects everybody who's associated with the team and it requires investment, even when the new roles and the new processes are well understood and well defined. Consequently, we need to be very thoughtful on what is the return that we expect from this investment and what is the what's in it for me for the people who are affected by the addition of the new teammate. So if we think about when we add people and redesign processes, right, it, it really kind of falls into a number of different categories, but often we do it if we can't afford the current approach or in today's day and age, as many of us are struggling with trying to find staff and have many openings across the clinical and administrative teams, and maybe that we just, the people don't exist. Um, we put new people on it, and then the new, new individuals that come in and interns on the stuff we don't want to do, right? The senior people give the junior people the stuff we can't stand to do. It's a new teammate. We try to do that. And that's another class of category of solutions where we put new teammates on. And then we've got the, hey, I want a second set of eyes on this, right? It could be because there was something super important that we can't miss, or there's something um, super important that we can't lose. And we want someone to focus in just solely on that so it doesn't get lost. And so I think, you know, as, and we also have to think about the fact that we're going to need to make the pitch for our new headcount to the CFO, right? And so when we're done with all of this, something's got to move the needle in such a way that they'll be willing to sign up for the investment in the additional um, individuals or in the additional technologies. So when I think we think about AI, I think these categories actually work just as well. How do we think about what can the computer do this better and faster? How do we think about the administrative tasks that we just don't want to do because we didn't go into medicine to work on paper work? And when it's successful, what outcome has changed? Um, and how important is that outcome and to whom? Now, the list on the right of the slide, it isn't exhausted, but it was a couple of examples that I am particularly excited about as I've looked through many of different innovations and reviewed many different companies' solutions. I think, you know, those, those of you that are working on making the documentation process easier or just eliminating it is fantastic. No one, we need the documents. It's how we get paid. It's how we get measured. It's how we communicate, but no one likes to do it. If you were to go back and count the number of nurses that you have in your health systems that are reading these documents and abstracting information, it's kind of horrifying, especially as we think of the North the nursing shortages. So those of you trying to find ways to automate information extraction, um, workless management, you know, the ability to read an imaging study that comes in, prioritize its urgency or shift it, move it to the right person at the right time with the right expertise to take a look at. All these sort of things are kind of categories that fall into this can't afford, can't stand, can't miss, can't lose. I think the other areas that are super exciting to me are the work that people like SegMed and the team are doing, because at the end of the day, these AI fellows, they aren't done at go live. Just like people, we're going to need to monitor their performance. We're going to need to look at retrain them when something has changed. We're going to need to look at drift. And so these techno fundamental technologies to either get them the data to be retrained 
or some of the work, for example, that Stanford's doing on assessing drift become very important because they're in essence the continuing education aspects of the fellow. And we need to automate those if we're gonna be able to um, make full utilization of these new teammates that we've got. So once you've got your elevator pitch on why your solution and when it works is obviously gonna be helpful and to whom, you know, it's time for us to do our, our ROI, right? And I know you guys are looking at the title probably thinking, okay, great, thanks, this is, this is rocket science. Yes, your return needs to be tied to your solution. You know, <laughs> appreciate the insightful insight. Well, you'd be amazed after eight years of reviewing different company strategies, both at Nuance, at Change Healthcare, and even as an angel investor, this is not easy. Let me give you an example. I had the opportunity to work with a company called iRhythm Technology, um, very early days. They're, they've now gone public. And what they were doing is they had the premise that said, hey, look, the Holter Monitor, which looks at 24 hours or 48 hours of cardiac, really only comes up with a diagnosis 25 to 30% of the time. And it's only because the way it currently works can only see 24 or 48 hours worth of information. If your arrhythmia doesn't happen in that window, you're out of luck. You got to go on to a diagnostic odyssey and it results in a bunch of other tests. So their view was, hey, look, we'll just collect more data. And to do that, we've got to change the ergonomics, make it more comfortable, hide it in a thing. So you could argue that, okay, the solution, the product was collecting 10 days worth of data and the medical device that allows you to do that. Well, problem when you look at walk in the shoes of the full team is that you couldn't use the current approach of the cardiac techs that have to read that data because they can't afford to do 10 times what they do for 24 hours or 48 hours. It just, the, the math wouldn't work. So then what they decided is, well, we've got to come up with an AI tool to be able to search through 10 days worth of data and bring forward the information that the humans needed to look at. Well, that looked like a whole lot of change for the tech team and further, you know, the, the payment process and the revenue cycle for this was going to be new and it was gonna cause complexities. So while this may be a win and a better experience for the patient, it may be a win and a better experience for the doc, it was absolutely not gonna be a better experience for your Holter tech department. And it was not gonna make your rev cycle people happy on this stuff. So what was the solution that they came forward with? It wasn't software, it wasn't a device. Their solution was the report. And they spent a lot of time doing the report, but what they did when they defined their solution as the report is that, and they took on the work of the cardiac tax and they took on the work of the, getting the rev cycle taken care of. It meant that they needed to focus their value proposition on proving and quantifying how this additional data was accurate, how it reduced the diagnostic odyssey and proving the obvious 10 days should be better than one day and um, a found answer should be cheaper for the payer. And so they reduced the number of people that they had to sell to the payer and to the physician, which was enough, but they were able to come up with the solution that was the report. It wasn't the AI, it wasn't the device, it was a technology enabled service. An example, there's some of these examples, right? Where the AI and the tech really is the solution, right? The time at Nuance with voice recognition, Right now, that is the product. The value prop to the finance guy is, hey, look, you're spending, you can spend X percent of what you spend on transcription for the technology. And the value proposition to the clinicians and the physicians is, hey, it's easier for me to talk than it is to type. And in that case, the, the solution is the product. In the other case, it wasn't. So I think this is one of these areas that we need to really be thoughtful and have the people who are developing these type of technologies have the debates on this, on what really is the solution and what really is the return. Think about it, have someone play the role of the CFO because getting this right is not easy. And it's actually results in lots of pivots as people try to learn the right answer on these things. The investment side of you know, your, new, your new care model or your new administrative model, I think we're a little bit better at We've really done a nice job over the years getting good at quantifying the techno technology elements of this. And 
all of those, all of you have been working in this space have also um, highlighted the fact that we need to be thoughtful on how we onboard our AI and the fact that we need to use our a health system's own or a payer's own data in order to do training and validation. And I think overall, we've gotten good at that. I think where we continue to struggle with is this concept that naturally goes away when you think about a team, a process, and an experience. Because we aren't super good yet at quantifying and defining what needs to happen uh, in terms of um, the people aspects of this, the process aspects of this, the governance aspects of the new solution. And we also kind of get tripped up by the fact that in an AI algorithm, just like a person, you know, the technical innovation and the monitoring doesn't go away at go live, right? You have continuing education for your people. You got to have continuing education for your, your AI fellow. You need to be able to determine when they need to recertify them or they start to drift, right? So some of those things that we would naturally think of if we were bringing on a new person, we need to consider when we do with the AI. And we haven't, um, when I look at these investments, right, we don't necessarily have the appropriate theories of the case on those. And it becomes really important as we start to think about is the juice <laughs> worth the squeeze? Because when you start to get into these areas of team dynamics and workflow and workload and changing someone's job when they're trying to comfort someone's grandmother and bring them help, you know, um, that cognitive load, they really are, those are really material bar barriers that we need to think through and have um, a uh, assumption or a hypothesis on because the finance folks will and the clinicians will. I think the last point I want to kind of make on this as it ties into this is really the important role of the early adopters and the innovators and those collaborations as we bring these um, technologies and these solutions and these experiences forward. Those of us who are in the innovation and we're in the early adopter phase, you know, we really love the, we're good with the ambiguity. We love the adventure of grabbing the machete, chopping through the Amazon, looking through the looking for the Mayan ruin somewhere in the in the wood jungle. We're okay with pivoting and figuring out. We love the art of the possible. We thrive on the complexity of these new puzzles. Quite simply, we're aliens <laughs> to those on the early adopter side who really have to think about how do I do this day in day out in a repeatable, reliable, efficient approach where I'm gonna get all sorts of complexity based on the teammates for the day, the patients that we're seeing, the new regulatory changes, the new rev cycle changes, all these sort of things are enough variation and we've got to do this with high efficiency and high reliability. And so those of, collaborations that are looking at the innovative and early adopter, we have to go beyond proving the thesis on the outcome that we're going to move and the technology investment to get that outcome and the quality of that outcome. But we, we need to do that. But we also need to think about the things that the manager on the floor that's leading the team that's gonna use this is going to think about. We need to think about processes. We need to think about who needs to be involved for how long. What are the new processes, procedures, and workflows? Who's supervising the AI fellow? How do we minimize surprises? And if there are going to be surprises, how do we give people a heads up that this could happen? And what is the escalation path? A lot of these things that we do naturally um, when we start to engage those of us who have been in process improvement, Lean Six Sigma, whatever the continuous pro uh, innovation arm is within your health, within the organizations, and those that would happen naturally when you bring in a seasoned people leader in and you start to say, well, what things do I need to think about to run a team? And then can brainstorm on what are the, what is the how when you start to think about the teammate as being the, a computer in addition to the humans. And so for those of you, if we're gonna cross the chasm, the output of these early innovations not only needs to be around the outcome, but we also need to start to create the tools that are gonna to be necessary for those of us who have to do things at scale 
to be able to um, launch, improve, and manage on the day-to-day. -day. We need to think holistically as we go forward. So I think I'm probably coming close to the 15 minute mark here, Martin, but I think you know, really what I wanted to try to do here is to start to maybe propose a new framing that allows us to do what we normally and naturally do and include people that know how to do things that stretch beyond technology. Include your Six Sigma, lean process experts, include some of your people leaders. Think about the human and the team and the process and the workflow elements in addition to the role that the computer is going to do. And realize that unlike going live with maybe a new MRI or a new 12 lead EKG, that these AI fellows are going to continue to learn and operate within changing contexts, within changing data. And so we need to think about the long-term effect of managing these new people and teammates versus just simply thinking about it as an individual project that moves on. And if we do that and we think about experience as being the outcome, then I think you know, we're gonna be able to continue to move forward. I think it's a super exciting time for AI. I am, I, you know, if others um, who know me have heard me say this a lot of times is that we are really at an interesting confluence now. And I think now is really the time in a lot of ways for technology incentives problems that we need to solve for AI to shine. And I think this, how we frame it will help us succeed in that. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the AI fellow concept is very, very interesting. Um, I'm glad we all could learn more about it. Um, so we are opening for the Q&A session. Um, uh, anyone who has questions, please uh, send uh, to the chat. Um, so I, I would make the first question. Um, I'm curious if you have any systematization or framework that you use as a health technology assessment when deciding uh, for a new technology, if it's worth to invest on or, or maybe incorporate into uh, the hospital or health healthcare system? Yes, we do. And I think, you know, a lot of that, uh, good question, I appreciate it. A lot of that framing actually gets back to how thoughtful people have in terms of walking in the shoes and understanding that the problem that is trying to be solved. And I think um, that there is, a what I've seen in a lot of cases is that with super smart people, we can solve about any you know, lean to the right, but solve most problems out there. And so often the problem isn't, can it be done, but should it be done? And what is this type of solution? So when we take a look at this, it really, we take a look at how simple is the value proposition. Let me go back to the, to the um, iRhythms example. It's, conceptually believable. Look, you're going to see more in 10 days than you're going to see in two days. Makes sense. When you do that, you're going to get rid of a bunch of tests. Financially, that makes sense. So it doesn't take 15 slides, right? It's, you know, there's a, yeah, you know what, that's, that, that's reasonable. And then it's really more of a question of figuring out how to do it. And also that there's money to be shared in that, in that case, right? Cost of 10, 15 different tests down to one the people creating that solution have an economic return that they should be able to share in. So there's the believability of the value proposition. There's the in-depth understanding of who's going to be helped. What is the market size associated with that? There is the evaluation of the technology. And then there's the thought how, what needs to be done in order to prove the new model. And so I think a lot of these areas kind of fit into it as you start to think of ROI, you start to think of value proposition, you start to think of market sizing, and you want to think of the path to, is the juice worth the squeeze when it comes to the people in the process? Yeah, it makes sense. Um, 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 we are always interested in learning more about how we could improve clinicians' workflow. Um, do you have an example of a solution that you think were successfully deployed that could 
um, maybe reduce the workload or the paperwork or anything related to that um, into the, the workflow of uh, clinicians. Yeah, I am, I'm, I'm really excited about some of the work that's being done in natural language processing. Maybe it's made from my time at Nuance on this stuff, but I, I've spent some time actually looking at the number of people that actually touch a note, you know, and from the creation of that note to making sure that it's right for all the audiences to extracting information out of it. We've got a lot of nurses and a lot of clinicians spending a lot of time managing notes on things. And so the first step of you know, voice, I think was a very exciting step. I love the work that's being done under various names around how do we make, eliminate the note altogether, you know, whether it's being done by Nuance or Modal and some of the others. I like some of the work that's being done by groups like Rad AI that say, okay, we're not going to eliminate the whole note, but we're going to make a big section and we're going to automate that, right? Getting rid of the process of documenting I think is, you know, an area that's going to have huge impact both on procedure workflow and satisfaction of the clinicians. I think the other area is the whole area of abstracting information and concepts from the notes, you know, in order to make quality measures to get our performance-based reimbursement. And the more and more we can automate that process of reading the note and then pulling out the salient concepts, the nurses don't have to do that or the coders don't need to do that, I think then that's gonna have huge impact in terms of both workflow um, and satisfaction. Awesome. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Christian, first of all, for an amazing presentation. I think we all uh, are learning or have learned a lot here. Um, we are running out of time. I do see that uh, Philippe just asked a question in the chat. So let's, uh, let's do that as a last question. Um, he asks, what is the best way to map a process across the different stakeholders to ensure everyone's needs are being met by a proposed innovation? Yeah, it's, um, you know, there's a lot of approaches to do this, but the way I've seen work has been a couple fold is one is observation really is important on things. I have found that you can put people in conference rooms and you get a list of things that could be this big. And then when you watch them, <laughs> it, it, the lens expands. And that's it's partly just being within the own environment. It's partly because as engineers and technologists, we often see things that maybe are just natural to people. So I think part of your process of doing that mapping needs to be observational and you just need to get into the, into the weeds with them. I think the other thing is that when you start to look at cross-functional, you know, the conference room approach with all the right stakeholders and the clear stakeholder analysis is, is really, there's nothing better than that, right? So you can come up with the theory of the case through observation, and then you have people fix it and extend it. And don't forget to think about not only the people who are gonna be using or interacting with the technology, but think about what the message is gonna be for the CFO or for the rev cycle or the money side of things as well when you do that mapping. Got it, got it. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, well, Kristen, again, uh, thanks for for being here. Thanks for giving this presentation. And also I wanted to thank all the uh, attendants for, for being here and for uh, your questions and uh, um, yeah, and for every time uh, joining the Bytes of Innovation webinar. So. Uh, thanks to everybody. Uh, next time we'll be uh, in the new year. So we have a little bit of a winter break now. I hope to see everybody uh, next year again. So thanks again.